Today's episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. If you're interested in true crime, head on over to Curiosity Stream to check out their popular docu-series Murder Maps. There's also the eight-part series, The Bone Detectives, that delves into some historical forensic anthropology. It's all very cool, very interesting. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms, web apps, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. It's a lot of places and it's available worldwide. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash brain food for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And right now, you guys can use the promo code brain food to save 25% off the cost of an annual subscription, which comes out to only $14.99 a year, which is incredibly cheap that feels more like a monthly price but no it's for the whole year so click the link below or go to curiositystream.com forward slash brain food and save 25 percent off right now which makes it just 14 dollars 99 for the whole year and now today's video It was July the 16th, 1970, and Mario Escamilla was furious. The 33-year-old native of Santa Barbara, California, had just learned that co-worker Donald Porky Levitt had broken into his trailer and stolen his most prized possession, a 15-gallon jug of homemade raisin wine. Determined to put an end to such theft, Escamilla grabbed a rifle and stormed off to confront Levitt. He found the thief with his boss, Benny Lightsey, getting roaring drunk on a potent mixture of 190-proof grain alcohol, grape juice, and... Escamilla's wine. Escamilla waved his rifle in the men's faces, warned them to keep their hands off his property, and grabbed what remained of his wine and stormed back to his trailer. Some minutes later, Escamilla heard a knock on the door. Expecting it to be Levitt out for revenge, Escamilla cocked his rifle and aimed it at the door. But the man who entered the trailer was not Levitt, but Benny Lightsey, who had come to reason with Escamilla. Though the two men were longtime friends, they soon began to argue and a fistfight broke out. Unknown to Escamilla, the rifle he had chosen was faulty, and in the midst of the struggle, the weapon and went off, hitting Lightsey square in the chest. Lightsey collapsed to the floor, and he bled out within minutes. While at first glance this might seem like a clear-cut case of homicide, or at least involuntary manslaughter, there was one big catch. This deadly incident took place not in some American trailer park, but on a massive iceberg floating in the Arctic Ocean. Mario Escamilla didn't know it yet, but he had just unleashed one of the most tangled and confusing legal cases in United States history, one whose consequences still resonate to this day. Fletcher's Ice Island, also known as T3, was an 11 kilometer long, 5 kilometer wide iceberg discovered by the United States Air Force in the early 1950s. Thought to have carved off a glacier on the eastern side of Canada's Ellesmere Island, the iceberg was named after Air Force Colonel Joseph Fletcher, the first person to land an aircraft on its surface. Caught in a current known as the Beaufort Jar, T3 slowly drifted through the waters north of Canada and Alaska, completing a clockwise circuit every two years. From March 1952 onwards, the Air Force and the U.S. Navy established a series of research stations on T3 to monitor Arctic weather conditions and to conduct geophysical and oceanographic research. These stations were a direct response to the Soviet Union, who had maintained meteorological drift stations on Arctic ice flows since 1937. The iceberg was periodically occupied until 1979, when the last research station was abandoned. T3 then slowly drifted through the Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard, entering the Atlantic Ocean, and finally melting away in 1983. But while built and maintained by the US military, the outposts on T3 were largely staffed by civilian contractors. Mario Escamilla, for instance, was an electronics technician from the General Motors Defense Research Laboratory, Porky Levitt was a meteorologist from the US Navy Arctic Research Laboratory, and Benny Lightsey was an employee of the United States Weather Bureau and the appointed director of the station. Conditions on T3 were primitive, to put it rather mildly. Even by 1970, the station where Escamilla and his 18 colleagues lived and worked consisted of little more than a diesel power plant and a cluster of prefabricated wooden James Way huts and trailers which served as laboratories and living quarters. In the winter, the sun did not rise for six months, with temperatures dipping below minus 50 degrees Celsius and winds reaching speeds of 250 kilometers an hour. Radio and satellite communications were spotty at best, and during the summer, the ice runway turned to slush, meaning no aircraft could land and the station could only be resupplied by parachute drop. But the greatest danger facing the station's inhabitants was boredom. Outside of work, there was very little to do, and for entertainment, the station had only a handful of books, a few 16mm film reels, and two 8-track cassettes, all of which the technicians and scientists 
scientists had read, watched, or listened to dozens of times over. In such an environment, alcoholism was rife, with many inhabitants spending their off hours going on raging benders with homemade wine or high-proof alcohol brought in by resupply flights. One particularly mean drunk was Porky Levitt, who, after guzzling his way through his own liquor supply, armed himself with a meat cleaver and went on a rampage through the station, stealing his colleague's stashes. It was this history of violence, Escamilla later claimed, that drove him to grab a rifle from the station's common store before confronting Levitt. Following Benny Lightsey's shooting, the incident was reported to the mainland by radio, and an investigative team was dispatched to T3. The team, composed of Navy and Coast Guard intelligence officers and an assistant district attorney, took two days to reach the iceberg via Thule Air Force Base in Greenland, a harrowing journey through brutal Arctic storms. The team then grabbed Escamilla, the rifle, and Lightsey's frozen body and whisked them back to the United States. And here, dear viewer, is where things start to get very, very complicated. At first, the whole case seemed to be fairly cut and dry. After all, Escamilla freely admitted to shooting Lightsey. He really could not have done otherwise. There wasn't any room in the tiny trailer for another assailant, and the incident was partially witnessed by Charles Parody, Escamilla's roommate, and the man who had informed him of Levitt's theft, and also Richard Scatolini, who was standing outside the trailer when the rifle went off. And the case might very well have been a simple one, were it not for one thorny issue that of jurisdiction. For what no legal expert seemed able to determine was who exactly had legal authority over Ice Island T3, and thus who, if anyone, had the right to try Mario Escamilla. While T3 was administered by the US Air Force as a civilian contractor, Escamilla could not be subjected to a military court martial. And while Escamilla was a US citizen, the crime had not been committed on sovereign US territory. Theoretically, the US could have made a territorial claim to T3, as it had with dozens of uninhabited, fertilized of rich guano islands in the 19th century. Unlike those islands, however, T3 was temporary and would eventually melt away, meaning no nation could claim the iceberg as its own. Furthermore, in 1909, the US State Department had rejected a proposal by Admiral Robert Peary to annex the North Pole, officially endorsing the view that no nation could claim sovereignty over frozen Arctic waters. So, who then? had jurisdiction over T3. The country with the strongest claim to the region was Canada, which had long claimed sovereignty over a large swath of the Arctic Ocean. In 1907, Canadian Senator Pascal Poirier proposed what he called sector theory, in which sovereignty over Arctic waters was determined by drawing straight lines from a country's borders to the North Pole. Whatever land or water lay between those lines was that country's sovereign territory. Conveniently, the system gave Canada almost complete control of the entire Arctic archipelago and the surrounding waters. However, sector theory was never formally adopted by the Canadian government, and Canadian sovereignty over its Arctic waters has been actively contested by several nations, particularly Russia. At the time of Benny Lightsey's killing, T3 was located 84 degrees north and 106 degrees west, far outside the then three-mile limit of Canada's official territorial waters. Furthermore, while international convention recognizes bodies of ice like glaciers as sovereign territory while they are still attached to the land, once they become detached, they become res nullius, no man's land. Nor that Canada wanted to get involved anyway. Upon learning of the case, the Canadian Department for External Affairs informed the US State Department that it wished to avoid interfering with a criminal trial simply to resolve a complex point of international law. Thus, the country waived any jurisdiction that it might have had while making it clear that the outcome of the case would have no bearing on its territorial claims to the Arctic. The T3 murder case was entirely a United States matter. Or was it? Because even if T3 was not sovereign territory, the first place Escamilla landed after leaving the iceberg was Greenland. Thus, as some legal experts argued at the time, the case officially fell under the jurisdiction of Denmark, which administers the island nation. However, like Canada, Denmark also waived its jurisdiction over the case. These decisions left the T3 case in an unprecedented state of legal limbo, with many lawyers doubting any country had the legal authority to try Escamilla. As one legal expert noted, it may shock the layman to learn that there may be parts of the world in which possible murders may go untried. One proposed solution to this conundrum was to treat T3 as a seagoing vessel and to prosecute the case according to the 1958 Convention on the High Seas. But, as you probably guessed by now, this solution was not entirely satisfactory either. While the Arctic Ocean certainly counted as the high seas, maritime law as written only applies to navigable waters, which the dense ice flows surrounding T3 most certainly were not. 
Then again, rapid advances in technology were quickly changing what it meant for a body of water to be navigable. In the same year as the Convention on the High Seas was written, the world's first nuclear submarine, USS Nautilus, completed a crossing of the Arctic while submerged under the polar ice sheet, a feat that would have been impossible for a conventional surface vessel. Furthermore, the practice of lodging a ship in pack ice and letting it drift with the currents, a method pioneered by polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen in 1893, technically made even the densest ice pack navigable. In the end, the US State Department and turn to another principle of maritime law known as the state of the flag rule. This rule states that the primary legal authority aboard a vessel at sea, whether made of ice or not, is the state under whose flag the vessel flies. So entrenched is this principle in international maritime trades that even if a vessel is sailing through a state's territorial waters, said state has no authority to prosecute crimes committed aboard the vessel unless those crimes directly affect the state's own territory and citizens. Thus, as Escamilla was a U.S. citizen serving at an out post flying the U.S. flag, the United States had personal, if not territorial, jurisdiction over the case. But even this breakthrough raised still further questions, namely, which U.S. state should Escamilla be tried in? While Escamilla was a resident of California, he was ultimately arraigned and tried in the District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia for the simple and expedient reason that this was the state in which he had first landed after departing Greenland. The trial was presided over by Judge Oren Lewis, who indicated that in the absence of a clear precedent, his judgment would not be final and that he expected the matter to be resolved on appeal. But even with the trial finally underway, there was still no end to the thorny legal questions. Escamilla's defense team questioned whether their client could be fairly judged by a jury of his peers in Virginia, arguing that the only people fit to judge his actions in context were back on the ice island T3. The research station, they claimed, was a uniquely harsh environment which placed its inhabitants under extreme stress. The station had no law enforcement presence, and doors were left unlocked due to the risk of fire. Under such circumstances, property rights were protected using weapons or not at all. Given Porky Levitt's previous drunken rampage with a meat cleaver, it was therefore argued that Escamilla was fully justified in bringing a rifle when confronting him. The defense also called on character witnesses to testify to Escamilla's usually docile nature, as well as a firearms expert who confirmed that the rifle Escamilla had used was faulty and could easily be set off without pulling the trigger. But Judge Lewis was having none of this, instructing the jury to ignore the possibly unique conditions on T3 and limiting the number of character witnesses that the defense could call. In the end, the jury found Mario Escamilla not guilty of second-degree murder on the high seas, but did find him guilty of involuntary manslaughter on the high seas. Escamilla was sentenced to three years in prison, but released on bail pending the outcome of an appeal. Said appeal was made on two grounds. First, the lingering doubts about the ultimate jurisdiction over the case, and second, errors in the conduct of the trial itself, particularly the limiting of character witnesses. The appeal was brought before the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, which heard the case on August 17, 1970. The panel of six judges was divided on the issue of jurisdiction, and thus upheld the original provisional ruling that the case could be tried by an American court on the basis of maritime law. However, they also upheld the appeal on the basis of procedure and ordered a retrial, instructing the judge and jury to consider the unique conditions on T3 and the testimony of character witnesses. With these new provisions in place, a second jury acquitted Mario Escamilla of all charges, and he was set free. The Escamilla case caused a stir among U.S. legal experts who pointed out that had Escamilla, Levitt, and Lightsey been citizens of Canada or another country, the viability of a trial would have been even more in doubt and may very well have led to an international incident. In 1984, however, the legal loophole responsible for this ambiguity was closed, in the U.S. at least, by Amendment 7 to Title 18 of the United States Criminal Code, which extended special maritime and territorial jurisdiction to any place outside the jurisdiction of any nation with respect to an offense by or against a national of the United States. While the Escamilla case might seem like a freak one-off occurrence, the incident is of direct relevance to another no-man's-land outer space. Currently, the only body of law governing human activities beyond Earth's atmosphere is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. However, this treaty only regulates the overt actions of nations, prohibiting, for example, the seizing of territory or the building of military bases on the moon or planets and the stationing of nuclear weapons in orbit. Also, spacecraft have generally been considered the sovereign territory of whichever nation launched them, meaning that the same Earth-bound rules concerning territory and jurisdiction apply in outer space as well. Thus, if an American astronaut murders a German 
an astronaut in the Japanese module of the International Space Station, then the case would most likely fall under Japanese jurisdiction. This neat legal arrangement, however, will rapidly fall apart as the likes of SpaceX and Blue Origin introduce more and more private spacecraft and astronauts to the final frontier. Though registered to their country of origin, such private craft are not currently considered sovereign territory and thus lie in a murky legal gray area. Without a body of law to regulate the behavior of private citizens in space, it is only a matter of time before we get a repeat of the 1970 Escamilla case, but in space. Even the closest Earth-bound analog to space, Antarctica, is of little help here. While well, the 1959 Antarctic Treaty prohibits any nation from stationing military forces on Antarctica, seven main signatory nations – Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom – maintain territorial claims on the continent for use in peaceful scientific research. These territorial claims have no permanent residence, so the inhabitants of the various scientific research stations on the continent remain citizens of their respective sovereign nations. Therefore, any crimes committed in any of these territories fall under the jurisdiction of the administering nation. And there have been a lot of crimes, including a 1984 case where a stir-crazy doctor burned down Argentina's Almirante Brown station after being forced to stay another winter, and a 2018 case where an engineer at the Russian Bellinghausen station stabbed a welder for spoiling the endings of the books that he was reading. Holy sh**. While these cases expose the difficulty of dealing with crime in such a remote location, for instance, for lack of a proper jail cell, the stab-happy Russian engineer had to be locked up in the station's orthodox chapel, all were relatively uncomplicated from a legal standpoint, involving citizens of a single nation on territory belonging to said nation. But in the wild west of outer space, with hundreds of spacecraft and astronauts from a dozen nations flying around, the legal situation is likely to get very complicated very fast. So if you're looking for a promising new career that looks impressive on a business card and sounds sexy at a cocktail party, might we recommend Space Lawyer? After all, in space, no one can hear you testify.